You are listening to the Reraceables podcast. Welcome to the Reraceables podcast. My name is Tom. I'm super excited today to be joined by two awesome guests, Kelly and Levon from The Amazing Race, season 32. Thank you both so much for being here. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about track and field. Um, I'm a coach. I told you that I've, I had the privilege of coaching track for two years. And um, I just want to start like, how did you, how did you both get started in track and field? So I don't have like the typical track person story. I didn't start running until high school. But, you know, when I was a kid, I would run outside and I thought I was faster than everybody. Well, I was faster than everybody else in my neighborhood. But then <laughs> when you get to high school and people who have been running track since they were born and their parents run track and are track coaches, I was getting whooped every day. But, yes, that's how I started running track because I thought I was fast from the neighborhood. And then I realized that sprinting is a skill that I did not know. Okay, you Is somebody finding you and saying, like, oh, my goodness, this girl is super fast. Got to get her into track. Or is it just... So yeah, my eighth, my eighth grade, like the end of eighth grade, you have, we have like field day at school and um, the track coach is out there and he's like, you should, are you going to, are you going to this high school? Like you should come out and run summer track. And I'm like, what's that? And um, so I signed up and I go and run that summer track. And then I realized that like people who allow their children to run summer track are like angels because those meets last all day and all night. And they're the most ridiculous uh, competitions in history. But yeah, I was 13. And then um, I started running super young um, because I have a sister who's six years older than me. And so she ran track. So then naturally you want to do what like your siblings are doing. Um, And then I started to like be good at it even when I was young. But I knew I was good just because I was like way better than all the girls. And so then I was like, hmm, let me race the boys. That'll be fun. And then I started being better than than them. And then it just kind of stuck. And um, I'm a bit braggadocious. And so you, you got to you gotta hold on to it. So it just kind of snowballed into where we are now. So like at 13, Levon, is that when you like you knew you could and would be great? Or is that just like I'm better than other people and this is something I should do? Like what? Heck no. At 13, I was hum- 13 and 14, I was completely humbled the whole year. Like, my team <laughs> was so good. Yeah. My team was so good. Like, at, like we were the state champions, and, the, the like, the number three and four girl in the country were on my team. And so, like, I was getting Hated them. every single rep, Hated every them. single thing. I'm just like, coach, can you put me in something that I can win? Because clearly it's not – being a sprinter and then that's actually how I started doing hurdles and so I dedicated um like a lot of my career to the girl who beat me every single day and every single rep who was Air Towns uh because had it not been for her I would just be a mediocre sprinter like I would have never even tried hurdles she had the biggest cast in history of <laughs> casting and so Levon and I are from about? yes Okay. Lavon and I are from um, the same state. We're about an hour and a half apart. Um, so whenever I would go to meets and I would see their team, I'd be like, oh, God, now I'm going to have to work extra hard because they were like, all of them were good. And I was like, so where are we getting all fast people from? Like, like, are we drinking from the same bottle? Like, what's happening here? Because all of them were fast. And it's like a funny, it's a, like a funny phenomenon because I was always on that team. So I didn't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like to like be a star on a team by myself and just go to a meet by myself. Like, <laughs> is that you? Is that you? Is that you? Didn't oh, yeah. Saying? No, I felt the opposite of like, I was like middle school, high school, always like the best on my team. And so like, once we would get to like a certain point of like going to state, you know, sometimes oftentimes I would be by myself um because no one else would make it and so like I would see all these people like Levon like with their team like ah ha ha yay and I'm like you're like <laughs> yeah you're, you're the mercenary over there the lone uh, ranger like the lone ranger yep last survivor 
and, and just to yep. date ourselves, back then we all had AOL instant messenger. So we like knew each other and like, you know, you can come and sit with us, like with our <laughs> team. <laughs> Chat what was rooms. the screen names? What were your screen Same names? Same name I have right now, La La Hurdles 2. <laughs> it was. La La Hurdles. And I don't want to say mine was Heavenly Temptress. Look, don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I was wise no. beyond my years. That, that's definitely an adult name. I... <laughs> Y'all know me. <laughs> I know. Was it spelled out or it had like, you know, a capital every other letter or it had like, you know. No, a, I'll still a remember it. There were like letters. There were like letters taken out and like it made it look like cooler. Um, but yeah, it was a hot mess. Lord. So we had this Moving right uh, along. Email VA. I I coach in Long Island and we coach, I coach track and there were uh, a couple exceptional athletes that we had. We had this one girl who's a hurdler. Uh, her name's Chibugo. She She's actually a hurdler at Penn State right now. And um, she would have that same type of issue that it sounds like you had, Kelly, which is what, like she had to basically train herself, compete against herself. And she had to like go to these bigger meets to verse the one girl that went, you know, was from the city schools. That was like her real competition. And it was hard. It was like, it was really difficult to, you know, she was a self-motivated, exceptional athlete. Like she had all those characteristics, the intangible stuff. So she pushed herself, but I could see, I was like, we would go to these other meets and even like the next school over our, our kind of our rival, like they had, they were the better overall team. They had all these other people that were, kind of not as good as our top girls, but, you know, they would kind of like in the meets where it was team versus team kind of take them down. But do you feel like, Levon, do you feel like because you were with that better team, like it helped you kind of grow and learn and like you needed that more? I think it was a great step to what I ended up having as a workload in college. So our team in college was really good, um, but everybody had an expectation that you had to do a lot of work um, to pull your weight on the team. And so that's kind of what I was used to in high school. I did a lot of events because one, another girl that runs hurdles that went to college with us went to our rivals, went to our rival school in high school. And um, so I had to do enough events to neutralize her points. So <laughs> it was like a lot. I learned about being on a team in high school. So like track and field in general is not a team sport, but obviously in college, you do it for points so that you can win as a, as a team. And so I think coming in from a team atmosphere and like loving that, I, I really enjoyed college more because of it. I, a, a lot of people who came from being alone were like, I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't Except me, I'm I'm chatty Cathy. I'll talk to everybody. So like it was, it was amazing once we got to college and all of us were together. And I was like, oh, we're all good. Oh, we can beat everybody together. So I don't have to do 40 events. Well, no, you still do. But I mean, you whatever. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but we'll just beat everybody by a lot. Okay. And Maurice Pierce tried to kill me, but it's fine. Um, so yeah, like when, once I got with them and we were in college all together, it was such a dope experience. Cause like, even to this day, we're all very much close knit. They're like my sisters. Like we will definitely like ride for each other. So it's cool. That's awesome. It's, it's, it's cool that you guys came from totally different situations, but it sounds like you both thrived in college. Um, and what made you guys choose that college? Were you recruited by other places? Like, was it because you knew each other? Did that play a role? Like, how did you land on the university that you chose and that pathway? So we're not the same age. So she was at Hampton already. And I, okay. she basically lied to me to get me to come there. No, I'm just kidding. Uh -huh. uh, there were lies involved. But, no, um, no, no. There were truths stretched. <laughs> you sound like a man uh but Wait a minute. <laughs> i live with a couple <laughs> um but yeah so the truth is is that like oh so my high school coach and my college coach were married and so he would come to my practice and like talk to me and stuff and i was like 
I live down the street from this school. I'm not going to this school. I'm not even applying to this school. And I, he's like, don't worry about it. Take all your visits. So I took all five visits to different schools. But all of those schools must not be good at sales because they brung a person who lives on a beach to a snow day <laughs> on a visit. Like, we're not in that. Not a good combo. <laughs> Yeah, especially like places like Virginia Tech, where it's like in the mountains, in the cold, in the snow, and it's not that diverse. This looks like a setup. Do you, did you actually want me to come here, or like what is this? I don't. <laughs> Sales is not your thing. Um, as a matter of fact, so then me and Kelly become like the liaison for recruits, and yes. we had like a hundred percent sign rate because All the I day. hope you have a good time. What we're we're going like of course. our coach never had anybody else host because he knew that we would kill it. Like we would give them the good tour. We're getting let, let them meet the chair of whatever obscure major they were thinking. We're taking them to a little party here and there. Like we had it under control. So it sounds like it was kind of like an easy decision. I mean, maybe not. I don't know, but it, it sounds like you know, uh, you played a, a role in LeVon getting there. Is that true? Or did you recruit Absolutely. LeVon, Kelly? Absolutely. So you, cause you knew her coach. or you just. Well, I knew her, but my coach also said, we have to have this girl, so get her. And I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> so um, then she came, this is a huge NCAA violation, but she came and was like practicing <laughs> with with me um at like I had like some Christmas practices maybe where I was like practicing yeah. by myself and it was you and who who was that Amy and, oh you're talking about um the other part Diane yeah oh oh yeah yeah um and there was another girl and so then we would practice together and then I'd be like hey you know you're really good but you should try doing this on top of the hurdle or put your arm here do this so like you know showing her that she could get better if she came to practice yeah. with us and then she loved me yeah that, that's, that's awesome. exactly how it happened I built that relationship and I was like oh they're gonna help me be better and then he recruited this girl who beat me at nationals and then I was like oh yeah I'm definitely going there and then he's like yes when y'all all come we're gonna do the hurdle relay that was a lie that <laughs> was one lie because we only ran it one time my entire college career and he put us under too much fire to do it. We had rolled on a bus for 10 hours to get to the University of Tennessee to run that race. Oh God, I'll never forget that. Me neither. So do you think, do you think the Olympics happens for you both or, or individually? I don't know. Like, do you think it happens if, if you don't go to Hampton? Is that, or is that like, how, how connected is that to the pathway you think looking back? So for, for me, for sure, I had never even thought about or knew anyone or even like something that's just like beyond your thought pattern until I got to Hampton. And at the time, a guy named James Carter, um, who was an Olympian, who also went to Hampton, was there training. And like just the, the idea of running beyond college, that was the first time I had ever even heard of it. And then Same for, for me, you, Kelly. It was James yeah. Carter the the guy that kind of put that idea to become a real thing? Um. Well, it was between James and then at that point, when I, my first year at, at Hampton, um, the head coach, her name was Mamie Rollins. God rest her soul. She's passed away. Um, she was on the Olympic staff as um the hurdle coach, a hurdle and sprint coach for women. And so um, that was one of my, you know, closing deals. I'm like, man, if she's the head coach at this school and our country has chosen her to be the hurdle coach, like she must know something. She was like the world record holder, like way back in the day. Cause she's like, she was old. So, I mean, like when they ran like the 80 meter hurdles or whatever that is, um, she like held the world record. So like she, she knew about the hurdles. And so, and just talking with her, um, knowing that like, you know, you could develop and then seeing that like James came and you can develop. Um, I think that I think about this often because there are a lot of people that went to like the bigger schools that didn't make the Olympics. And I'm like, I wonder if I would have chosen like one of the big power fives, would, would my body have been burnt out by the time it was time to go to the Olympics and time to, you know, be up? Because that's what happens to a lot of people. Like just because you go to a big school, like there's so much that comes with it that by the time there is to make that like transitional turn it's difficult 
you get to uh, you're in college, you're you're develop, you're meeting people like the uh, your coaches and James Carter, like you described. Like, what's kind of the first um, what not to be you know too corny, but like you know what's kind of the first major hurdle that you like you run into in college? I mean, it sounds like you know you're on this great path, you're in this great program, you got these amazing coaches and people that are putting these ideas you know, into your minds to like become real, like where's the first major hurdle that you had to overcome on that pathway? There's a, 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 a many of them, um, but you know, just seeing the difference in our programs to like maybe a major program, you know, there, there's a vast difference. Um, and then at that point we were in the MEAC conference, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. So we were head and shoulders above those teams, but then we were, you know, below some of the major teams. So trying to find that balance of like, you know, training schedules, when to be good, you know, looking at them and they're like, oh my gosh, they bring a trainer to the meet and they have a massage therapist. And like, we're just out here like thug central, just holding it together. Um, so I think just learning the difference, but then also knowing that like, man, when I step on the line, I can still beat them. So not being intimidated by them. And then also working with the younger girls as they come in and they see like, oh my God, LSU, I'm so scared. And you're like, for what? You can't die running track. Well, I mean, you can, but like, <laughs> you're, you're not going to die today. So like, just put on your big girl draws and go compete. So it's like, you know, coming from a mid-major, we always competed against the majors. And so just getting used to that was, was, was a step. And then every year was a step because you have a new crop coming in. So then you had to like, you know, take them back to like, girl, don't worry about that. Or because, you know, they're like fresh out of high school and they're like, oh, my God, I saw such and such on TV. And you're like, oh, God, all right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> get your fangirl moment out the way. Let's we have a job to do. So what is then the process then for overcoming all these hurdles? Is it, you know, like whether it's. uh life or on track or um in the race or uh, when you're on big stages like like what's kind of your processes for overcoming adversity so for me i just readjust how i look at things so how you perceive it is more important than what's actually happening because a lot of times we start creating things in your head that aren't actually happening just because of the fear or the worry or the whatever the case may be if you just like like you could be really angry right and you're like texting like you're texting and you're really angry like texting and then if you sit and you <laughs> realize that you by yourself and you're angry and in the present moment nothing's actually happening to you you're like wait a minute whoa 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 you're tripping. And so I take that approach of like becoming consciously aware of my present state and like that most things are not what they seem. And especially when it comes to track, like, yes, you race the same people over and over and over. And you're really just only racing yourself because you're just going down a straight line with hurdles in it. And you do that every day at practice. Um, so just getting past the, the heightened exterior things and becoming more centered to myself. Kelly, it sounds like you kind of, part of your process was kind of that mindset of like, don't worry about them. Like, let's just worry about us. Who cares if they're LSU, whatever. But what else, what else was part of your personal process for overcoming different, you know, challenges? I'm always trusting in myself and knowing that like, I prepared for this already. This is the easy part. Practice is the really, really hard part. Practice sucks because you have to do something over and over and over the meat you come you do it once or twice boom you go home there's some snacks there's some orange slices you're good money but to know that like I put in the work at practice and so then that forces you at practice to have accountability for yourself because if I'm at practice and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do I'm not slacking and I'm not bsing then I have no choice but to do well on Saturday or whenever that meet is so it's just knowing like I've already prepared for this. Like there's nothing that I can do any better today that's going to make me any better. So nerves are fine. Nerves mean you care. So that's, it's not, it's not that, but you can't be paralyzed by them. You have to embrace this feeling, know that you might feel a little queasy, you might have butterflies, but like 
track and field is so cool because I may have won a hundred races before this one, but today's a new day. It's a fresh day. Um, and so I feel like with anything, with any job, with any task, every day is a new day. So you can't look back and be like, oh my gosh, I wonder what at, what what would have happened or I wish I would have. No, you just have to start from that fresh day. So it's just like taking small bites of the burger instead of like trying to shove the whole thing in your mouth. I say that to my students every day, you know, whether it's whatever skill we're doing or if it's my players, like, you know, just trying to say like, don't shove the whole piece. I use pizza. I don't go burger, but I, I try, you know, don't shove the whole slice in your mouth, right? Like try to take a one bite at a time approach. Um, so let's jump to the Olympics if we could. Um, how would you describe the Olympic experience, right? I mean, it's, I know it's a big question, but I mean, how would you describe <laughs> the Olympic experience for you? It was the best time I've literally ever had, ever running, ever. Um, it was scary. It was exciting. Um, doing it with like somebody that I'm super close with um, made it that much more comfortable because oftentimes the Olympics can be a very isolating feeling um, because it's like the world stops and you're in this bubble inside the village and you have no idea what's happening outside of this bubble. So to have like, you know, it's like your little kid with like, they carry their blanket around. Like LaVon was like my blanket, like we're good. We got this, like we're, <laughs> we're gonna make it. Um, so, but it was so much fun. I loved meeting all of these athletes from like different sports and different cultures like countries that, you know, I've never visited because we've been to like a lot of places, but like Papua New Guinea, like who goes there? Like, but they have, they send yeah. people to the Olympics and yeah. So, you know, trading gear and meeting people and, you know, it, it was just so much fun and like enjoying the, the spoils that it brings, like the different houses that you go to getting the free stuff beats by Dre or going to get your nails done. Um, it was just a lot of fun. And I mean, competing was the most amazing thing ever, just because I've never heard or felt a crowd that loud in my life. And the stadium was packed, even for 8am sessions. It was crazy. Like it was to me, it was the best city to have it in because UK fans, they come out like sun, rain, storm, they're going to come out to support. And it was amazing. LeVon? I concur 100%. It was so much fun to, especially like meet people from other sports, because, you know, we know people who run track already. Yeah. So you, I'm kind of trying to avoid them. Like, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, getting to know people from other countries, other sports, like learning about sports I never heard of, like the modern pentathlon, who knew what that was. Um, Table tennis. Amazing. Exactly. Was and then the same about like countries that, I had never heard of, I had never heard of the Maldives before 2012, met the girl, she ran the 800, and then all of a sudden, everybody goes to the Maldives for honeymoon, and I'm just like, yeah, it's beautiful <laughs> there, they have the huts on the water, it's amazing, yeah, yeah. The, the long pier and the whole thing, mm -hmm. that's right, that's and then that, just so. like being, London was amazing, because it's very rarely that you're going to be in a place where like, the culture is similar enough that you can like maneuver and mm -hmm. go and do things and not feel like I'm unsafe. lost. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so like I was out all the time going out, taking a cab, which is way too expensive there, by the way. Um, and just like really immersed in the culture, having a great time, you know, definitely enjoying the free things getting the opposite experience of what going to another like I've been to races in London before but the people were extra extra friendly like not the normal way that they say British people act and, <laughs> and no they, they did something they did something to keep the sun out and they did something you know it was just like wow the clouds are not over London for the first time in ever you know so except for my final <laughs> We're going to, I want to talk about that. I hope it's okay at some point. Yeah, but, of course. Um, so how much do you then, like, it sounds like you kind of got out a little bit. It sounds like you got to see part of the city and, you know, but how much are you getting to like experience the Olympics in, as like a, 
I'm here. There's all these things going on. Like, do you get to watch stuff or is it like you're in super focus mode most of the time and you miss out on like seeing tennis at Wimbledon or, you know, yeah. the swimming events or stuff like that. Like how much do you get to experience of the Olympics? The good thing about track is it's kind of early. So mm -hmm. we were still there long enough to be able to go. Like I went to a basketball game. I went to a swim meet. I went to a tennis match. I, I tried to go to gymnastics, but obviously that's the most popular thing. So oh, yeah. We weren't were getting no in tickets. there. <laughs> we were not getting in there. And, and um, so yeah. I also went to see volleyball. I thought awesome. like those things are things that I would have not seen or think about seeing any other time. So, yeah, it was good. I, I enjoyed yeah, so like, like I didn't like living the Olympic experience. Yeah. yeah, I didn't go to anything before I competed. Um, as a part of like managing my emotions and exhaustion, because especially going to the track, watching people that you know and love compete, you get up with them, and that's a waste of your energy. I need all my adrenaline to stay in one spot <laughs> till I need it to disperse. So, um, up at like up until you know my finals. I really didn't do anything. I may have like ventured out a couple of times to houses to like Procter and Gamble or Beats by Dre, stuff like that. But then after that, I was out there. Um, I went to like <laughs> table tennis. We went to the club. You know, we really experienced what we were supposed to experience because for a lot of people, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And um, totally. so you should like, yeah, we went and lived it up. I went and saw like Misty May and Carrie Walsh in the gold medal match. Um, the best part was my final, um, my coach tells me like, don't look in the stands. So obviously what do I do? Look in the stands because I yeah. do the opposite of what I'm told. <laughs> and I look in the front row, like maybe almost midway down the track. It was like the basketball team, like Kobe, LeBron, like all of them. And I was like, holy sh wow. crap don't mess this up don't mess this up like you watch them play now you got to put on a show and like you know it was just so cool to see all of the other athletes supporting you know their country or a sport that they enjoyed um so yeah like but watching sports I mean anybody that watches sports understands that it is tiring to just watch so you have to be super careful about that as well I coach football, I coach track, I coach badminton. I, and I, I, I interact with athletes and I try to help them be better people, you know, first and foremost. Uh, we don't have many Olympic athletes that I've ever coached. You know, I haven't had that uh, privilege yet. Um, but my question is like, I have been privileged enough to, to watch legit D1 athletes. Like I told you, the one girl that's at Penn State, another girl that's at Kentucky, um, a distance runner. And like, I could see from the first minute, like, okay, those two girls are at a whole other level, right? Like they are <laughs> unbelievable. Like the, the ease in which they're doing it, they're beating people by crazy amounts, all that stuff. But like, my question is like, what makes somebody an Olympian, right? Because you, the two of you were the top percent of the top percent, I assume, right? Like, there's, there's amazing people, and then there's the amazing of the amazing that have this opportunity to go and represent a country at the Olympics. Like, what makes somebody from extremely good, you know, stand out at LSU or Penn State or whatever to Olympics? Is it like, is it talent? Is it will? Is it work ethic? Is it? I think luck? it's work is ethic. It... I think a lot of it is work ethic because there's a point where everyone is good. And so what are you going to do to be better than good? And it's not because like, it, like on my, on my training group, I think at one point we probably had what eight hurdlers, like we could fill yeah. up, you know, a whole track and there was like eight girls. And so, you know, what are you going to do to, to be better? Because we all do the same workouts, you know, it's, the coach gives us the same stuff. It's not like he's going to tell me like, Hey, you know, run a little extra, you know, so it's what you do when you go home. It's what you put in your body. It's your, how you rest. If you are out at the club, dropping it like it's hot, you know, obviously that's not <laughs> going to get you to where you need to be. So, um, and then it's also hanging with like-minded people. 
um, like Lavon, if she has the same goal as I do, then we attach to each other because, you know, Kimberly down the way may just want to do this as a hobby or because it's fun, not because she wants to have that killer instinct. So really understanding that it's the stuff that you do outside of practice, you know, your push-ups, your sit-ups, your diet, your load management, all of that kind of stuff, and putting yourself in a group of people that will support you to be better and also not hate on you for your accomplishments. Levon, is there, is anything you'd like to add? Um, I think that's a thorough answer, especially because at some point, almost everything is the same. So beyond the fact that the people you train with are doing the same workouts, everybody in the world is doing the same workouts. They're doing 200, 100, 400, 300 lifting weights and all of that stuff and they and they have talent and all of that um but eventually it comes down to like work ethic but work ethic what it does is creates like a confidence um within you that makes you compete better and compete better all the time and that's that's all being a pro really is it's like you can't just only be good sometimes or like when luck has it or when you feel great it's more about like being able to compete when it's required, which could be every three days. Who knows? Yep. Yeah, I try to I try to tell my athletes, no matter what sport it is, to you know always bring that their highest level every day because you know I it's too hard to try to like rely on flipping a switch, right? Like it's too hard, especially the the, the more you advance, the higher you get, the higher the stakes. The minute you're not doing something is the minute somebody is doing something. And that's it. That's what it seems. Flipping like. a switch that, takes that, way too much energy. Exactly. Right. That's like, what I. That's, that's what I tell. So them. tiring. That that's the best part about being in a bigger group is that like no matter what, some days you're gonna feel like shit. I mean, you're gonna feel bad, and then um on some days. <laughs> somebody else is going to feel bad and you're going to be good at something and someone else is going to be good at something but because it's a whole bunch of y'all someone's going to be having a great day and you're either going to get dragged through the workout or you're going to uh, rise to the occasion and just make it work and so like that's the like iron sharpens iron and you want to be mm-hmm. surrounded by people who are trying hard even when uh they don't feel like it because the worst thing about practicing with other people is is negative energy travels like cancer and it's really fast Mm -hmm. so let's go to the starting line in in your heat and um levon i'll start with you you know pre-race in the race after the race like what's what's happening in your heat at the olympics i mean you're you're there you're you know you're doing your process like what's going through your mind before the race during the race and then after the race kind of at London 2012. Oh man, this is like a trick question for me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a whole backstory to this that I just feel like this is going to be too long for this episode. However, so okay. I stayed up late okay. at night uh, because I'm a supportive girlfriend, mm. and um, <laughs> and exactly. <laughs> Uh, and so I set up late and the bus to the track was at about six o'clock in the morning. I went to bed around one thirty. Uh, so you can only trick your body into doing so much, even if you trick your mind. So like, I'm like, I could wake myself up with pre-workout and Red Bull. So I'm having it. My mind is going super fast. My body's like, eh, eh, mm, eh, maybe not. So I'm just having the worst warm up of history in my life and it is displayed in that race. But so that's why I said this is a trick. This is, this is a trick question and a trick answer. Uh yeah. Wor- worst com- competition for me in a very long time, but then I got I mean I got a, a lot of good lessons from it. I wrote a book about it, you know. So <laughs> That's amazing. Don't sacrifice yourself for others. Don't. So, Kelly, um, you're in the final. You got, Mm -hmm. as you said, LeBron and the the basketball team near the finish line or wherever they were. They're cheering you on. They're there. I mean, how about you? Is, is um, Is there any difference in your process, like 
between you know the the initial heats the semis the finals like is there any difference like is the magnitude of the moment feel you feel it like take me through that that final yeah it's about to happen um so I remember telling myself like when I go make this final we're not going to make the moment bigger than what it is um those seven other girls that were there yeah seven because I'm eight um I'd raced them all season and I'd beaten everyone that was there so it's just another race and I remember I just kept telling myself that it's just another race because it's very easy to get swept up in the oh my god this is the Olympics ah like so um I just remember like that was the most calm that I've ever been before a race um because I'm really high strung anyways so like I'm always like ah, ah. um and I just remember being like hmm, this is cool this is cool I wasn't happy because it was raining and they took our clothes yeah. so like we were outside you know in our uniforms in the rain so like I was like mm, not cute but um like I just was very very calm and I knew I was gonna run well um because the night before because you run your preliminary round the first night you go to bed and there's two more rounds the next day I slept that night because I expected to be like up all night like a frantic idiot um but I remember I ate uh and then I went to bed and I slept and I was like oh they got their hands full like this is about to be a problem um and then I just went into it I was more nervous for the first round than anything um because it was a surface that I had never touched before and I had never practiced on it. So like the, the unknown was there. And I remember um, being like the sprinters, um, both of us were dating sprinters at the time. They were like, oh my God, the track's so fast. It's such a fast track. And you know, you're like, hey, why don't you shut up? Like I have to go hurdle on that tomorrow. Like you're doing the most. Um, so that was what my fear was. But after I ran on it, I was like, oh, this, this is fine. It was a really fast surface though you go to the Olympics, you get to that race, you go through your process, you succeed, you win the bronze medal. Um, you, after the race, I see, I, I've watched the tape and it's you you get the results. And then it's like, you go right over to uh, Sally, the gold medal winner, gold medal winner. And you, you give her like this big hug and like, what are you feeling in that moment? I mean, that's something that very few people will experience. Like, what is happening in that moment? Honest answer? Thank Please, God yeah. that is, is it... over. Thank God this is yeah. over. Jesus Christ. Oh my <laughs> Lord. Like, I was just so glad that it was over and I ran well because like from, from the Olympic trials to then this was, there was just one goal and it was, you know, make the team, make the podium. And so I knew I'm like, God, I did it. Thank you. And like, I just wanted to enjoy the feeling because even when we made the team in um, Eugene, like there's some enjoyment, but then there's that feeling of like, you got to get right back to work. Like you can't, you can't take this time off. Like you let your body, you know, rest, heal up. So there wasn't much time to like revel in it. But, you know, after that, I was like, oh, this is good money. Like, this was amazing. And, you know, I was so excited to like go grab my flag from my federation and take the victory lap. Like people are like holding their babies out for you to take pictures with. And like, it was like the coolest, like most fun time. But like my first, my first thought was, thank God that's over. Oh my God, thank you. Wow. So no like frustration, are you even like, you're not even like, I didn't win. Does that come into play at all or no? no I mean, heck no, no. My t Till this day, my bronze feels like a gold. Um, you know, to be part of, you know, if you do the math of how many people make the Olympics is like 1% of the world. And then, you know, it's even less of those who get a medal. Um, because if you think about it, like the great Gail Devers, has does not have an Olympic medal or Olympic gold medal in the hurdles. And she's Gail Devers, like the best of the freaking best. Like no one could beat her at a point. So to think that like, you know, I joined the ranks of, you know, people that I looked up to, like there was never a moment of disappointment at all, especially like coming from a small black HBCU, you know, at one point I couldn't break 13 seconds and to look up and my time was 12.48 seconds, you know, like I was completely thankful, a hundred percent thankful. Wouldn't take it back for anything. 
so what would you say to like did you did you talk to any olympians um when this whole pandemic and everything kind of started and the postponement of things i mean levon did you talk to did they did you converse with anybody like what do you say to those people i mean that's got to be an insane thing the craziest thing is is like um, all the olympians that i talked to were on the this is my last olympics i'm really over this i can't wait until it's over to have it pushed for another year just kind of talking them off the ledge sort of like okay you got more time you have more, like like i i just gave them that if like you have more time you're gonna get you're gonna get the most rest you ever got in your life you're probably gonna be feeling great you're gonna be confused like you're gonna go through your workouts this fall like oh my gosh i have no pain since never in your life so yeah right <laughs> i'm like you got look at it as a blessing um because there isn't there has you know there's never time usually never. you're running a whole season you start and you may have just been getting over the little pain you had last year you start training again and so to have time and to figure things out figure your body out and all that stuff i'm like it's a blessing in disguise take mm -hmm. it for what it is and then I'd I would tell them you had to go to the trials and then you'd be more pissed if you had to go to trials and then they canceled it. Because what? <laughs> pissed. Like we got to fight. Like something has to happen because that would be, that would be horrible. Um, and I yeah. told them along the same lines. And then I said, it's it, you have, everyone has to wait. It's not like some people get to go and some people wait. So there's not an unfair advantage. So you can't worry about circumstances that are beyond you. Like no one saw COVID-19 coming. So you control what you can control. So that means I control if I sit around the house and eat Cheetos and drink soda all day. Or, you know, am I gonna go still work out? Am I gonna modify my workouts? What's the plan gonna be? So, you know, just because there's off time doesn't mean that there's off time. Like everything has a plan and the best athletes, regardless of what sport it is, are very methodical. So you have to go back to the drawing board and completely new plan. No one saw this coming, but it's here for everyone. So what are you going to do to maximize your time? So you talk, you said, Kelly, circumstances beyond your control. So I have to take that and kind of segue into uh, the amazing race. So um, on the podcast and my website, like I try to have as much fun with the show as I can. And, you know, with my friends that I'm, I'm sharing kind of the, the watch parties with, we came up with these different rankings that I, we got on my surfboard here for the, for the, from 11 to one, um, okay. you know, I got some different categories. Everybody's got the different categories. Everybody had you guys really, really high, including myself. I had you in my, my sleeper picks, you know, I thought you guys really had a good chance at it. You know, I like uh, the athletic uh, piece of it. I like the, you know, you've traveled. You said that in your promos, like that really uh, helped you. Um, I like what you said about like having the uh, wanderlust, you know, and that, that itch to get to compete, but also travel again. So my first question about The Amazing Race, do you feel like you got to scratch that itch? Like, do you feel you had an early exit? You didn't want that, obviously. Do you feel like you got to scratch that itch that you were talking about, Kelly? Absolutely. Um, you know, Lavon and I have done some really cool sh stuff together. You know, um, like I, <laughs> when we sit back and I think about like all of the fun stuff and the stories that we've that we have that we can laugh about. Like, hey, you remember that one time? You know, so this is just another notch of life experience that we've had. And we got to travel, run around, do some really weird, crazy stuff that we would never just do on a humbug. So um, to me, it was like all love. Like, of course it sucked, like getting eliminated. Um, and, you know, I cried because I was really mad, not because I was, um, you know, so sad. Like it sucked, but I was really mad because it was from circumstances that were beyond my control. So, and I'm a huge control freak. So there's that. Um, so, but I mean, yeah, like it scratched an itch. We got to hang out in obscure places and, you know, hotel rooms with all the food you can eat and 
you know, answer questions that you never would take. We took or, or like be asked, we took the Wonderlick test. We could go be quarterbacks in the NFL now. Really? We got it. Like it, this is, this is cool. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of psychological testing for this, obviously, because I mean, right. they put you under very, very, very stressful situations. Very. And from what you see on TV, multiply that by a million. And that's how stressful exactly. it really is. Those two episodes are actually five days. So just, it, it, it's just such a, I mean, I, I was actually concerned with the amount of like psychological testing we had. I think, I was like, I think they think we're going to kill ourselves on TV. I don't know why, why I'm not gonna do that. how we feel. Like, yeah. <laughs> what was some of the testing that they were doing? What was the questions they were asking you? you have to do like scenario tests. Like, you know, if you were like going on a job interview and they ask you like, if a person yells at you, what, what are you more likely to do? Or all kind of questions like that. And then we have to, you have to talk to a psychologist just like Twice. about their life, about their traumas, about everything. Just, it was, it was really a lot. It was intense. Personal, it's a personality evaluating type thing. And then there was, you know, have you, yes, have you thought about killing yourself? And they ask you that a smooth eight times. Like they ask you that in different word forms and different variations. Um, They ask about like recreational drug use and like if you, if you do it and if you're doing it to like cope with something, because obviously when you're out there, you can't just like pick up stuff. Like you got, like, like you have to like cope and it's very, like, it is very stressful because it's a lot of hurry up to wait, to hurry up, to wait. And going five days without like, I mean, the stuff that you take for granted, like being able to brush your teeth in your own bathroom or, you know, taking a shower or getting in your bed. So things that like you never think of or having to sleep in a room with, you know, 20 other people and they all smell funny and snore. You know, how are you going to deal with it? Funny story is that apparently... On on the um on the reality super fan show, we found out that Kelly is the first person in history to bring a bed. <laughs> to bring a what? I had a blow bed. up bed. A bed. A yeah. bed. So you had yeah, a yeah. bed in your back. Yeah, but I mean, it rolls up really like small. I still have it, and like you just blow it up and you sleep on it. And Levon made fun of me until we were sleeping on I the floor of somewhere. <laughs> yep, until we were sleeping on the floor, and she, I felt her. <laughs> all I heard was like, like, sh- dog, I was like, like mm-hmm. right. <laughs> until you're in a salt mine in the middle of uh, oh my exactly. god, Columbia. Was... But we have really nice, we have really nice uh, sleeping bags sleeping there. Bags that there. Yeah, that was bed. cool. But so, the floor in the LAX or the floor in the Trinidad Airport or the floor in the Tobago Airport. So, yeah. So that wasn't like a suggested item. That was just all you, Kelly. Like I'm gonna bring. Well, they don't suggest any items. Um, they don't tell you what to bring or what. They just tell you what you cannot bring. Like there are very hard parameters on what you cannot pack. Um, but they don't tell you what to bring. So then I watched like, um, different people that have raced that went on YouTube and like made videos of what they packed. And I can't be the first person that brought a bed because I know. Um, there are two girls, they were the purple team. One of them had it. Like, I know that for a fact, because that's how I got the idea. And I was like, huh, they won. Good idea. I thought you were just in a camping show. I mean, campus store getting sold. I mean, I definitely was, but I mean, (laughs) I needed it. Yeah. So you get on to, you're at the Hollywood Bowl. Like, what, what's happening in that moment? Like, the race is about to start. You're looking around. You're pressure players you've been to the olympics you've had people yell go and you take off that's been what you do but are you is it similar to the olympics is it comparable is it totally different totally different like literally totally different the olympics i know what i'm doing i know that my race is at 11:47 and at some other <laughs> other obscure time so no this is literally like Um, Because there's lots of like takes that we have to do over and over of, you know, getting shots of things and um, we had to run up this long hill at least five times so they could get the shot and, 
um, Birch and Phil are very particular and they want to see certain things and okay, go back down, run it again. You're like, oh my God. Like, because the hill was like, promo, so, and this is right before we start. So, and they've never even because, showed any of that dumb stuff either. They've never showed that. And I want, like, at least not, not enough. Not <laughs> is that the one That's where like, you guys are like this? Yeah. Is that the one where you guys are like kind of like jogging yeah. along and that? Up the hill. Yes. But there's like, it was like a huge steep hill and we had to run it with our packs on and they're fully packed because we knew that we were about to leave that night. Um, so lots of stuff is like reshot and reshot and reshot for try. I mean, at a, at a meet, you run, you go home. That's it. You warm up, you run, you go home. So it was completely different, like completely different. So you start the race, the first leg, um, you run into the fish out of water challenge and Kelly, you mentioned uh, dyslexia. Um, I'm a special education teacher. And um, I'm always curious, like, because I always have to try to get into the mind of my students. And like, what do they see? Like, what are they seeing? And I'm trying to understand from their perspective. So like, when you get to that challenge, and we see the fish, we see the numbers, we see the colors, like, you know, I, I go back to you, you know, the Cosby show. And you remember the episode where like, Theo is the teacher and he helps the kid like put the pieces together. You, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I, I think of like, that is my only reference point to like what a kid sees or what a person sees with dyslexia. So like when you see that challenge, like what is it that you're seeing? Is it, is it so different from what we're seeing? Like what? Yeah, it's totally different. Um, there was so much chaos out there because there's 11 teams all yelling out different colors and different numbers. And there's a rule on the race that you can only be 15 feet from your partner um, and, and your camera people. So there's already that to think about. And then you have people on the boats yelling out to their partners, eight, seven, six, four, red, blue, yellow, green, blue, yellow, green. And I'm like, oh, God, ah, ah. Like, you know, you're overstimulated. You can't remember your numbers. And then you're already tired because you slept on the floor of an airport. You're hungry because there's no food. You're thirsty. And like being thirsty and doing anything is very uncomfortable. Being tired and hungry so you have all of these components so it was just like the numbers and the colors would not stick in my mind so I kept yelling to Levon like what's the number if I thought that I found the fish and she you know obliged she understood that like I was struggling a little bit and you know she and she was really good at remembering the number um but there was just so many fish out there there were so many people and it was like at one point, I remember I was putting in the wrong code. I, it was the right numbers, but the numbers were reversed. Um, so my dyslexia doesn't affect me in like everyday life now. Um, when I was younger, it did. And I learned coping mechanisms and things to, you know, understood, understand what triggers me. And so what triggers me is high, like stressful situations. Huh. Look who threw herself into one voluntarily. So you you're running that leg and obviously, um, you know, again, things beyond your control kind of take over a little bit. Um, you know, traffic, taxi drivers, uh, you know, things of that nature. So like, I don't know, how much worse is the traffic when you're racing than we see? How much, how much more dire is the situation when you're in the cab and the, you know, that cab driver is just forgetting his power cord and, seemingly killing your your chances here the first time that he didn't follow the gps i instantly got concerned <laughs> um because we didn't really know like when we first put it in it's like two and a half hours good gracious okay this is far oh just chill not really paying no attention then you see it and it's two so let's say we've been in the car for 240 two hours and now let's say we've been in the car for like an hour at the time and then it's, it's got like a veer off. We're in traffic, mind you. It has a veer off. It's supposed to get off the highway. He doesn't get off the highway. Of course, what does the GPS do? It recalculates. And then it adds an hour back. Wait a minute now. <laughs> One exit. And he's like, no, no, faster, faster. Whoa, what? No, that. And I'm so, like, I can do math. That's not faster. That's slow. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a negative so how number. Much, like. <laughs> so what do you do in that situation? Like. 
Right, right, right. So how do you, how do you, you're in a cab, you're, you're stuck. Like, what do you, what do you, what yeah. do you do? What's going on in your mind at, the, at that point? We're telling him to follow the GPS so we can get to the place. And he's like, okay, okay, I understand. So we get into the city and this is when his phone starts dying. Like he's giving us the phone at this point because we're arguing. Like, you're not following, right. you turn right here, turn left here, da da da. We get close to where the university is, and the phone starts dying. And then we're like, oh, we don't know where to go. So then we have to just like, okay, park right here, and we're going to run. We're going to figure it out. And we ran for at least, what, 12 minutes or so? Like, we, because we had to run to our destination when everybody else got like dropped off there. So it was just all bad. Like, it was all bad from the beginning all bad at what point did you at what point do you know that you're behind and you're kind of around ninth tenth and then like at what point do you know like oh man we, this might be this might be it at yeah. the truck at the truck because this leg was super spread out that um a lot of teams didn't even see other teams while running so um, we knew like once we got to the truck and then we got there and we put our, our truck together like so fast. I would love to know like the time lapse on like how fast we did because we got there, we put our truck together and we asked for checks while people are still putting their truck together. Um, but we just didn't know the horn. So we finally get the horn. But then once we leave there, our taxi driver takes us 45 minutes in the other direction, like in the wrong direction. Uh because we were only supposed to go oh, 10 man. minutes from where we were. So, because we left at the same time as Frank and Jerry. So we're thinking, all right, if we get there, we're going to hop out of the car. We're going to beat them to the to the mat because there ain't no way. Ain't not, no, way. not a, no, like it's not happening. I'm and built for this. Me, we, we wanted to, like, we're sitting here. I'm, I'm with my wife and with my two other friends. We're watching. We're like, I want to see them run. Like, can we watch them, like, just completely embarrass people? Like, I really want to watch you guys, like, just fly by. Yeah, you beat the goats, but who cares about the goats? Like, you know, I want to see you run by Jerry and Frank. I want to see you run by, you know, Haley Which we've Haley also, and- yes, which we've also found out that um, teams were targeting us to get us out just for that fact. Like, it was like a thing. So what did they do? Like, wh- where, what, what does that mean that they were targeting you? That they would not help us under any circumstances so like d'angelo would funnily enough we were on their podcast and he says that i yelled and cussed at him because um we could not find where we signed up on the board at we already had our um we already had our hourglass and we could not find that board and so i he says that i yelled at him i don't think i did but nonetheless he told me where it was after after i yelled at him that's what he said but i was like i feel offended that we have the most in common of everybody here and y'all didn't even offer to help us. <laughs> he's like, no. Like, no, <laughs> he's, he said, yes, he said, we decided that if there was at the first opportunity, we were going to get y'all out because we cannot, he was, he was like, we already knew that you guys were really smart and you're fast. We don't have the time to deal with y'all. And I was like, oh, oh. Strong move. I mean, it's a compliment to the two of you, but you know, I guess it's, it goes back to like you're saying with like the training and stuff when everybody's at the same level and everybody's there, it's like any little advantage could be the biggest difference in the world. Not saying where the board is and then you sign up and then you're in the second grouping versus the first grouping or something like that. That's yeah. because Gary that, literally happened, that literally happened to us twice because when we got into like the, when we're in Trinidad pushing the barrel, we're bumping into Will and James who get the last spot on the first flight to, right. uh, so like, it's just all of those, like right at the cusp, you almost made it to be in a safer group. Um, <laughs> but no, you end up in the back and now you're not in the mind five. So the mind five, they're helping each other. So people thought that Leo and Alana helped Haley and Kaylin for a bias reason, but they were in a mind, they were in a mind alliance that we didn't know anything about. And, you know, it just so happens that Kelly reads lips and that worked out for us. But it also, she, she ain't got no discretion. So she ain't walk over and say, LaVon is the horn. She's like, LaVon, the horn. <laughs> 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 I 
mean, there was only Jerry and Frankie at that point, and you know, it was it was a split second, and it was more of a like, oh, you intentionally didn't tell us. Yes. Yeah. Well, shout out to Leona Lana. Love y'all. So that was that wasn't there was no ill will. It wasn't like what kind of like Gary and D'Angelo's mindset of like targeting the two of you to try to like get you out. Was it just kind of they saw Kaylin and Haley or, you know? No, it-, it was intentional. Like they, they walked, because like our truck was in the middle of Leo, of, of green team and pink team. And so they walked around our truck um, and chose to help them. And, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm sure, but, you know, we've heard that, you know, if it comes down to a run, we know we're going to lose. So why would you want to keep them at something that you know that they're strong at. So I understand it's a game. Like people are like, are you so pissed? I'm like, no, it's a game. It's literally a game. And it's a game we played two years ago. We actually like each other. <laughs> Facts. Yeah, we all love each other. So <laughs> this was a long time ago. I, I didn't have any hair on the side of my head and now I do, so. <laughs> it's Is it weird to kind of relive it that far after? I mean, it's, you know, especially in this, everything is now on demand world that we live? Is it weird? Very much. Like, to the point where I'm watching it almost like everybody else. Like, I forgot all about that. That's crazy. <laughs> like, the, uh, we, had, we did a podcast the other day, and I, and I mentioned that the cap fell off of our oh, horn. Yeah. And I was like, I forgot all about that, because they don't show that on the show. Because I, I, I honestly feel like, we just picked every sabotage thing, period, for that leg, because when we put the horn together, a cap fell off already off. I don't know. But so the horn didn't actually work the first time. So then they judged Frank and Jerry. Then we put the cap back on, and then it still didn't work. And they're like, it should be working so you can go. Like, what? You guys are cheap. Wow, that's I, – I guess you can't help but think about stuff like that, too. Like, along the way – you know, I, I, in my classroom, I have this great plan or on the track, you have this great plan of how the race is going to go or how your class is going to go. And then all of a sudden the, the, the cap falls off the horn. And then it, it probably lags a couple, a minute, 10 minutes, whatever it might have delayed you guys at all. And that, that's a big deal in a race for a million dollars, you know. Right. You said that, uh, LaVon, I believe you said this at the uh, beginning of the episode. I don't know if they're foreshadowing. You said you hate losing more than you like winning. Yes. It needs a t-shirt. <laughs> it, it does. Um, Business ideas. We have, we'll talk later. We gotta, yeah. yeah <laughs> we got to we gotta make that happen. Um, so what does that hold true? I mean, when you, you guys said before, like you're you know, you're grateful, you had this amazing experience, you grew closer in your relationship, but does the losing, you know, stand out above those other things because you didn't win? I mean... The lo- the losing stands out a lot because, like, I was telling Kelly the day that it was coming on, I'm like, I literally have anxiety to watch it. I don't even want to watch the episode because there's really no reason to be losing. Like, you're, you're way, we're way too good at things to have lost in this way and this early like it's almost offensive like y'all need to bring us back for all-star like like literally we're always like, like give us yes our own show. <laughs> give we deserve me to be back like oh gosh i just want to run it again because like i'm like god like we like we're really good we're really good what would you do differently what would be the biggest change that you would if you if you did get that opportunity uh so it so for me everything is all like it's just like any sport everything is about momentum so we were so far behind that you create these little lags which includes like not reading the clue because you're rushing and just like i gotta get okay uh, uh, and then put put it down and then we we did read the um it comes with a clue and it comes with more instructions so we re- reread that and it didn't say anything about the horn on there. And then I do remember say, it's saying horn, but you know, as a person with a regular level of intellect, you would say a horn is inside the car. So right, you know, right. I'm never oh thinking, let me look underneath the car for the horn. So right. that none of this is registering to me until, you know, they're like, oh, look, look, the thing underneath. And as a matter of fact, I recall like 
in your rush, in your rush, and you foreshadow, and you see, and you're like, there's a random horn, or there's a random orange thing underneath the car. That's random. Not and really I never saw it. I never I, even saw it. And, like, I was working down there, and I never saw it. But um, what, I think I, what would I do different? Um, I would probably, like, we were friendly with everyone, but I would probably try to create more of, like, alliance or you know to have that understanding with people of like hey help like because like I thought it was way too early in the game to start making alliances because they always there's always a curveball there's always a shake up um so I thought it was like way too early to like really focus on that so maybe from like the moment we're permitted to talk because we spend a lot of time around people that and we're not allowed to talk to them um so maybe create that alliance or like just be more like understand that sometimes you are going to run from the back and just be okay with it and like yeah. like not get flustered or punch the cab driver in the back of the head maybe I would do that because <laughs> piss me off his name is Evangelista I'll and, never forget it and I would par- I would pack way less like yeah just way so less. much less like a way lot less. of a lot of the issues that were has like yo this bag is heavy as heck it's hitting my neck I can't take it <laughs> Well, I, uh, I want to just say thanks for coming on. I appreciate your time. So cool to be able to talk to you and, and, and learn about your experiences, um, especially as a coach, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I'm rooting for the athletes. I was so upset to see the two of you go out so early, you know? Um, yeah. And I appreciate, you know, taking the time and, and being on the, uh, the podcast. Of course. Yes. Thank you so much for having us. I got family in Long Island. So next time I'm over there, I want to come and talk to your team or something. I know. We have to, like, get it together where, like, maybe we can, like, zoom in with your team or something and give them, like, a do it for the Gipper speech. That would be – um that would win me some serious points. So that, that I would Well, as long as that, we're but... getting you points and they're not giving you a hard time. like <laughs> Exactly. No, I appreciate that. And – um you know, I would love, I would love to talk to you again, maybe when the sports start up and, and maybe set that up. I would appreciate that. Sounds so. good. Anytime. So, thank you so much. All Kelly right. Levon, season 32. You. Bless you. Thank you for being on the show. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. All okay. right. Front piece. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.